Welcome to the Swim Strong Dry Land podcast. We are dedicated to inspiring and educating the swimming world. Our podcast highlights the work, character, and achievements of in and around the Swim Strong community. We are here with Coach Chad Winkle from Wave Aquatics, the head honcho over there. And we have a lot of good insight to get to. But first, we got to get into the most important part, the rapid fire questions. Chad, are you ready? Yes. Here we go. Number one, what's your spirit animal? Ooh, definitely a wolf. A wolf. Okay. Yeah. How about your favorite cartoon show growing up? That'd be between the old Ghostbusters cartoon which I loved, or He-Man. Oh, wow. Um, you got to pick one. Oh, He-Man then. All right. <laughs> there you go, He-Man. How about if you're on a deserted island, you can only pick two Wave Aquatic staff members to survive. Who are you going with to save your life? Yeah, I've been prepping for this one as I've listened to your podcast. So I'm <laughs> ready for it. I um, think I'd have to go with Coach Robin because she's super outdoorsy. And she'd probably be the only one on our staff that could keep us alive. <laughs> and then my second choice would be Coach Aaron. Um, and that is just because I love hanging out with Coach Aaron. He always makes me laugh. He's just a funny <laughs> good dude. And if you're going to be stuck on an island and bored, you need someone to entertain you. Um, <laughs> and that's Coach Aaron in my book. You got it. And, and laughing keeps your hopes up. Got to yeah. keep hope. How about a hidden talent you have that people don't know about? Um, I don't know if it's a talent. Um, I love like slow smoking different cuts of meat. Um, and so I do that on weekends when I have the time. I don't know if I'm actually good at it because I really only feed my wife. And so she always <laughs> tells me it's really good. And then I like it. But so for us, it's a talent. But I don't know if anybody else would actually like it. But that's 100 percent feedback. Do you have a favorite cut of meat you like to smoke? Um, Like ribs or a good pork butt. I have, a, <laughs> I have a feeling they're pretty good. If you were not a swim coach, what career path would you be on right now? Ooh. Um, I think the easy answer here would be probably like coaching a different sport. Cause for me, it's not like a hundred percent just swimming. It's more coaching. Um, so if I didn't go into swimming as my coaching career, I'd probably be coaching a different sport um, or teaching of some sort. Okay. And this one's a tough one. What's the best hospitality room in the country that you've ever been to? Oh, well, that's easy. It's Wave Aquatics. Uh, <laughs> our Mr. President, Stephen Blackman, shout out to Stephen, um, puts a lot of energy and time into making sure that we are one of, if not the best hospitality in the LSC. So that way all the officials and all the volunteers want to work for us. Um, that's awesome. He does a really good job and puts a lot of energy into it. And so um, I'd have to go wave aquatics. Take note, people, a good hospitality room leads to volunteers and people who want to help and come to your meet. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. We, we right, have last... a really good reputation for it where like officials will be like, yeah, we'll go to this wave meet because we'll at least know we'll get good food. <laughs> Don't underestimate the hospitality room. Last one. What's your favorite thing about swim strong dry land? Ooh, I feel like I have to say Sean, just to make your sister mad. <laughs> um, so, uh, my favorite thing more conceptually is, is just the positive energy that you guys all bring. Um, it's just a high energy vibe, which is like not my demeanor. Like I'm very mellow, very direct, not like the rah, rah type coach. Um, and so I like having swim strong because I feel like you guys bring that layer um, to our team. That's awesome. Well, we appreciate it, man. And we're super grateful to work with and serve you guys at Wave Aquatics. Um, the Wave family is incredible um, and has been for years being partnered with you guys. So we're appreciative um, and appreciative of your time here today uh, to be able to dive into your story and share some inspiring and educational stuff with all of our listeners. So um, Chad, could you dive a little bit into just your background and how you even got into the sport of swimming in the first place? Yeah. Um, I mean, when I was a wee little kid, we had a YMCA up the street from us that my mom used to walk us up the street to for swim lessons. Um, and then when I was five, um, I started swimming summer league. Um, my parents were big on us playing multiple sports and trying everything. And so, um, 
we swam in the summers. We didn't really ever get into year round swimming until I got older into high school. Um, and yeah, so I started summer league. My aunt was the head coach of the team. Um, and my mom was the lane slip lady because I'm old. <laughs> we didn't have touch pads or meat manager in that. And you used to, have to go get your lane slip. That's uh, awesome. So my mom would spend it all Tuesday and Thursday writing out the lane slips for everybody. Explain uh, more of the lane slips to people who have no idea what you're talking about. Well, yeah, you used to get lane slips to go behind the lanes. And then that's what the timers would write down the times on. And then they collect the lane slips and then they write it all down. And that's how they kept like results and scores and stuff. See, Before technology. Yeah. <laughs> it's a continue so, story. Might be dating myself a little bit. <laughs> Usually don't feel old, but that story made me feel old. <laughs> I love uh, it. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, I played a bunch of different sports um, and then kind of through my teens, got into more soccer and swimming, um, especially in middle school, got into swimming um, in the winter with a um, middle school swim team. And then, yeah, kind of stuck with it. I was average at best as a swimmer um but i loved the team side of it and i love the work side of it um mm -hmm. anything that's like you got to work to get better at is something i tend to lean towards yeah um and so graduated from high school went to college and then about my junior year um i needed a job um during college and so i went back to the old club i coached at or swam for and started coaching um just as a job and during my senior year, they offered me a full, well, during my senior year, we merged with the Cincinnati Marlins. And then when I graduated, they offered me a job um, as the head age group coach for our North Satellite. Um, and have just been kind of coaching since then and moving up through and to different teams and stuff. That's awesome. How did you know when you got into coaching in college um, and you were got your first gig swim coaching, did you, was there a point where you were like, oh yeah, this is what I want to do long term or... Was it like a gradual overtime thing? You thought, hey, I'll do this for a little bit to make ends meet in college and then I'll do something else? Or how did that happen? Um, I definitely started off as like, I'll make ends meet and um, make some extra cash to, you know, pay for college and pay for life and stuff. And mm -hmm. um, kind of through that first year of coaching, really fell in love with it, really enjoyed interacting with kids, helping kids learn stuff, develop. Um, I mean, like I'm a competitive person, so the it was itching that or scratching that competitive itch that kind of was always there. And then um, by when we merged with the Marlins, that's when it kind of made sense to me, like, oh, this could be like a full time professional job. Mm -hmm. um, and I was lucky enough with the Marlins where they had the ability to bring on a satellite a head age group coach and um, train me and teach me a lot of things. Yeah. So, can you talk about your journey to wave, how you ended up um, as a head coach at wave aquatics and um, running the business there? What was that like? Did you ever see yourself being someone as the, um, the president slash head coach of a, of a club team? Um, or was that just something that happened organically? Um, so I definitely, if you would have told me when I first started coaching, I was going to be the executive director running all that I do with wave. Um, it's probably not what I would have thought the where the ship was going. <laughs> um, so I started off as head age group coach at our satellite for the Marlins. And then I took over the satellite um, and spent a few years in that, um, which was awesome because I was working with a bunch of um, well-established coaches and was able to learn a lot. Um, and they did a great job of teaching, especially that coach there, Chris Wilford. Um, I personally feel like he really – Put a lot of interest and time and energy into teaching me um, and explaining things and then after a few years i kind of was like well i think i you know the you know youth ignorance of youth of like oh i got this figured out now <laughs> um i can do this and so i was kind of looking for um a head head coaching opportunity and so i was like looking around and interviewed some places um, and i got hired up in ketchikan alaska and I was like, oh, well, it's a small team. It'll be a good chance to get out of Cincinnati and kind of see the world. And mm -hmm. we wouldn't want to live in Alaska for a little while and experience that. Um, so I spent three years up in Ketchikan, um, which was awesome. I definitely learned a lot, um, got humbled in some areas, kind of learning and failing and figuring things out and 
Um, it was definitely different kind of being the head coach and being out there um, on my own figuring stuff out. Cause with the Marlins, there's always like the safety net of other coaches to go ask and like yeah. other higher up people to fall back on. What were the, I, I want to jump in just quick, just yeah. to ask what were the, cause a lot of people don't share about those things. What, what were the humbling things for you? The challenging things that you're like, Oh, maybe I don't have this all figured out. Maybe I still have a lot to learn. Cause I think something that a lot of coaches struggle with um, all of us from time to time is like keeping our uh, any insecurities close to the chest and only project like, Hey, we got this figured out. You know, we're, we're, we're the coaches, we're in control and, and we know what we're doing. And obviously like there is a great level of expertise that coaches have, but we're also humans and allowed to make mistakes and allowed to continue to learn and grow because that's, that's what humans do. And that's what good coaches do. But what were some of those experiences that you feel like you went through that you were like, Oh, there's a lot left to go. Um, yeah. I mean, we're trying to keep the podcast short, so I'll try and pick just a few. Um, <laughs> No, I actually um, was listening to something um, about kind of the art of coaching um, is one of the things I listen for just education. And like they were talking about being humble um, and being honest and forthright with like not knowing stuff and being OK with that. Um, and that's definitely something that I feel like I've learned over time to just be OK with, like not having the answer. Um, but it's specifically up in Alaska, I think. Um the first thing was just dealing with parents. Um, I like back with Cincinnati Marlins, we had a really good system and like the team had a lot of stuff already well established. And so I kind of went up there to catch can and was like, all right, here's all these things. And like, just jumped into it. And, you know, looking back, it's like, you know, pick one thing to do really well and start changing, turning the ship. Don't pick mm -hmm. seven different things. Cause you're not going to do seven different things. Well, and to get buy-in into seven different things is hard. Hmm. Um, and so just being patient with that, taking your time, um, that. And then also just, it was my first time coming into a new team. And so I had fortunately with the, Mar with the Marlins and with um, PAC before, which is the team that merged, we, um, yeah. like I was coaching the younger kids and then I moved up and moved up. So like I had an established relationship kids trusted me, parents trusted me. And so then I was coming up to a brand new team and um, just establishing that trust, um, especially with older senior level kids um, was definitely a new experience for me. And I definitely mm. hit some speed bumps. I think we got there in the end, um, especially by the end of my second year, um, we were able to kind of reestablish the senior program. But the first year was rough where there was a lot of you know, back and forth where people weren't happy with it and all that. And then yeah. once they started getting some results, then the trust was kind of there, but to do it again, I would build the trust um, before trying to do some stuff. Yeah, no, that makes sense, man. I appreciate you sharing those things. Those are just like real honest answers that are part of every coach's journey. And uh, so just coaches knowing like, it's okay to not know everything. It's okay to not like be able to come, come in and just change the world from day one and to fail and to struggle and to different things like that it develops you into a much better coach, which, you know, I have the privilege of getting to experience, you know, you go, have gone, gone through all these experiences, which we'll get to, but so going from Alaska, what was the next step right after that? Um, yeah. So then I was looking to get out of Alaska because I mean, catch an awesome place and I loved it up there, but living on a Island can catch up to you a little bit. Um, and so I was interviewing, um, I got offered a few different jobs coming South, um, and kind of the wave aquatics jumped out with the head coach here, Tyson Wellick. Um, and I was excited to get back to where I was working with someone who could teach and help me grow. Cause I feel like through the three years up in catch can, I went from that youthful ignorance of like being confident and like, even though I probably shouldn't have been to, all right. I'm starting to figure this out more and I'm starting to get this, but I want to keep learning and keep growing. Like I want to go somewhere where I can do that. And um, Tyson has a great background in swimming. He's doing biathlon work up in Canada right nowadays. And um, so got hired here, took on that with him um, and kind of worked my way up. He was here for a few years. Um, he stepped down, they brought in a new head coach. Um, he stepped down after a year and they offered me the interim head coach. Um, and so I kind of took on the swim team and was running that. And then 
we went through a few executive directors um, and just wasn't really working out. Um, and then they eventually offered me the executive director head coach role for Wave um, and kind of took on that too. Um, and so that's what I've been doing for the last few years. I don't even know how long it's been. Yeah, I was going to say, was it five years ago? I don't think it was that long. I got offered the executive director role during COVID. So some, sometimes through that process. You know, it's crazy. COVID in 2020 is 2024. So that could have been at least four years ago. <laughs> that's, that's crazy. It seems like it was still yesterday, but um, wow. And right around that time is when I had the privilege of meeting you and when Swim Strong um, partnered up with Wave Aquatics yeah. about four years ago. Um, and 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 that's been awesome for us and for me particularly to be connected with you and to see your mindset and how you operate the team how you run uh the business to set your athletes up for success i can hear even in the stories that you just told a lot of things make more sense now too to why you have this always be learning mindset and you don't just talk about it you do it i mean you've brought us out for three years in a row for a clinic you've brought other people out for different clinics you have educational opportunities you're always looking to bring guest speakers in you're always trying to do everything you can to give your athletes and parents and coaches resources um to be better um does that come from your personal experiences now knowing what you know and you're like hey i don't want coaches to miss out on maybe what you felt like you wish you would have had when you were in that time in alaska or like what is that just something that um you know, how do you feel like that developed? Um, that's a good question. I think for like bringing you guys out and bringing um, the other Olympians or clinicians that we've had out on a regular basis um, does stem from just making sure that what we're offering as an organization um, is the best product that we can, um, best experience for the kids. And then, and part of that comes with having really qualified and educated coaches coaches um and so if you can do both at the same time that's what i try and do um so we consistently try and whoever we bring out do some sort of work um with our coaches and then also really make sure the kids get a very personal experience um but i think that just comes from as far as like the concept of always be learning like i think that's just how i am i like i don't i've never felt like i've had all the answers like I've always felt like I can do more, I can work harder, I can figure more out. And the only way to do that is to do the work and to get out there and learn and educate yourself. And so I've tried my best to do that. Um, and then I've also just the type of person that just the new challenge is always the most exciting thing for me. And so like moving out of just coaching into like executive director, there's a whole nother world of like business that mm -hmm. I've never seen until I took on this role. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it's just been, all right, let's surround myself. And so like, we've reached out, got HR help, financial, help, like um, hire people in the financial realm to educate and teach me on how to do that type of stuff. And so it's been awesome. And like the great part about that is our overarching governing board has been very supportive of like, hey, we trust Chad to do this and we wanna make yeah. sure he has the tools to need. And so whenever I've come to them with, this is what I think would help me. Like they've been very good about supporting those moves. So you have an awesome board, a governing board, and you make all kinds of things happen, but that is super unique. Like there are a lot of coaches and teams who can't even bring on a program like swim strong because nobody wants to spend any money for any type of outsource thing. Um, and everything's about the dollars and cents, let alone, doing clinics, bringing guest speakers in, doing things on an annual basis to have education for your coaches. Like that, that's very unique. And one of the things I consistently hear talking to coaches across the country is oh my board. Like, uh, I just, it's always like a clash of the boy. I could get so much more done if the parents weren't just thinking about their kid on the team, but they were thinking about the team as a whole, or they weren't just focused on the dollars and cents. And I think, you know, that, oftentimes the board is a coach's greatest support system that helps a team thrive or it's the coach's greatest enemy. Um, you guys are the former, right? Like an incredible support system, but how, 
what advice do you have to other coaches to get to that point where like, Hey, let's do what's best for the kids. Let's do what's best for the coaches and like support our parents. And we're working together here, but let's let the coaches do their jobs. Like that's a, it's a pretty amazing thing that you have that yeah. a lot of people would like kill for. Yeah. Um, I won't take too much of the credit for it because I kind of walked into it. Um, so the coach that was here before me, well, not the head coach, but the uh, head coach I came on Tyson, um, had worked really hard on establishing that um, kind of mentality at our government board level. Um, and then anyone that's come on our governing board since then has done a really good job of educating the newer board members on what their role and responsibility is and then holding every, each other accountable to it. Um, and so there's been times where things have come up and I've had to be like, well, that's a little bit on the swim side. We don't want to jump into that here. Like we, if you want to email me or talk to me about it, like as a parent, like happy to do it, would love to have that conversation. Um, but that's not what here is. And, but realistically that happens once every other year anymore. If that, um, a lot of times when it comes up, other board members will kind of step in before I even need to, or have to, um, and kind of redirect things to where it should be. And, we're fortunate in our structure where we're not just a swim team. So we run um, two different pools. Um, we run them on behalf of the school district out here and then a um, municipality. And then we run our swim lessons program, which between both pools, we have 700, 800 kids in the water for the, just swim lessons. Our master's teams is a hundred plus folks. Um, and so we have 150 people on staff, I think, give or wow. take, um, between our guards, life instructors, swim coaches, everything. And so that type of structure really allows the, like, really pushes the minutia of the swim team stuff that I think a lot of coaches run into. And, like, I saw it when I was in catch game with some board members. So, like, I know what you're talking about. Um, and I've heard stories from talking to other coaches and everything. But we just – we have bigger fish to fry than some parent worrying about what this coach is doing in practice. Like we're, mm -hmm. we're talking about what are, what's our long-term vision as an organization, where do we want to go? And, you yeah. know, it's, it's consistency. Once you kind of establish that culture, um, which I, again, I was fortunate enough that someone else kind of set that and then it's just keeping with it. And we've had good presidents that help keep with it. And then I help foster that. That's cool. You have, so you, obviously you have a team of freaking rock stars. Um, what's the messaging that they give and that you give? If you could, if you or another board member was to give advice to parents on another team's board to say, Hey, this is, this is your role. Like when you come into this position, this is how you're going to help your kid and all the kids and the coaches be great and help create an environment that we're looking for. Like, do you have like specific things that when people come in, this is, this is what they know their role is? Well, I don't know if it's about bring like what you're doing when you bring them on, because by then it's too late. I think what we do a good job of is um, we take our time when selecting new board members. Um, we interview, we meet with them, we talk with them. Um, and then as a board, they vote on whether they want to bring them in. And the board really listens to my opinion on, you know, what that parent has done, has been like, do, have they been volunteering? Have they not been volunteering? Or like, what's their um, history like? And so we don't rush in new board members. We, we really make sure that when we select someone, we're selecting someone that is going to get it. Um, and then once you bring them on, it's just kind of showing them the ropes and doing that. But it's, I mean, it's the same as like hiring. Like, it's just, you got to hire the right people. Yeah. Um, and when you're in a pinch and you got to rush someone in, then that makes it that's when you lead to, to bad hirings and you got to fire them and then you're back at square one or you're further back because you hired poorly and yeah. we've been able to kind of take our time and really make sure we pick the right people that's really interesting i i don't know if a lot of people view it like that and that's I, that's really smart it makes sense um, because the board has a huge impact on the team culture um if they want to <laughs> and um so that's that's really good advice and coaches. I, I, I've been very impressed with the way you run the structure of the team because it allows the kids on the team who you're focused on to thrive, right? When all those other things are taken care of and you're not stressing about the board or the finances or um, all these different behind the scenes things. 
um, you get to just focus on coaching, right? If the business is running properly, you get to focus on what you're here to do. Is that right? Um, maybe not me, but that is the goal for all my coaches. For everybody else, yeah. <laughs> uh, I don't think that's realistic in my role to not no. have to have, like carry those stresses. But that is right. the structure that I've put on for all of our swim team coaches. Um, and that's been something I've been very particular about and very focused on um, is – I want a great coaching staff and I want a great coaching staff that's focused on coaching and the team. Um, I don't want them worried about um, a lot of the minutia type of stuff. Yeah. And so I work through that. Our associate head coach does a lot of work with some of that stuff too. Um, coach Aaron. And, but for the most part for our staff, like they're worried about communicating to their group, meet entries, getting their kids signed up for meets. Um, and then coaching, showing up to practice and having the energy, having the focus to really do a good job day in and day out. Yeah, that's awesome. And you talk a lot about, um, you know, when you're bringing someone on and looking at their history and how they volunteered and how they served and really alluding to like the wave culture, the wave way, which is something that you have um, created kind of an outline. You and your staff have created an outline of the wave way. Um, which I think is huge, taking that time, stepping back and being like, here's what we expect from everybody top to bottom. If you're going to be a part of this um, part of this team, a lot of teams talk about team culture and fostering team culture. Very, very few teams take the step back to be like, this is this is what we're committing to and have all these different things in writing that you go over with athletes and coaches and parents. How did you talk a little bit about, well, what is the wave way, first of all, so people know? <laughs> Um, that's a loaded question. So, <laughs> um, I guess that goes back to first, how our team structured, um, coming towards the end of COVID when we were gearing to open back up, um, but in a limited capacity, um, like most teams, you know, it was a financially tight time. Um, and so it was, all right, what can we do to set ourselves differently from other organizations and to be in a spot to grow and develop and um, come out of this better than we went into this. Um, and that is when we shifted to our sport and select or like teams. Um, so we're structured where we have our sport team, um, which is for entry level kids um, at all ages. And then also kids that, um, potentially do not want to make the commitment. Um, one of the things you always hear from coaches is, oh, we want we want everybody to play different sports growing up. We want them to mm -hmm. do this, do that. But then they have practice six days a week. And so mm -hmm. I've always kind of felt like the irony of like, yeah, you want this, but you're not given the opportunity. And so mm -hmm. um, I felt like out here we have a, a large number of kids that were on our team that also were an orchestra or band or had math camp or science camp or like they do a lot. I mean, kids do tons. Mm -hmm. And yep. so setting up a sport team that was built around giving kids the ability to enjoy the sport of swimming, get quality coaching, grow, develop, get faster, but also not having that full on commitment that, you know, to be at the top level you potentially need. Um, and so that's kind of the heart of where our sport team came from. And then also our select team, which is, you know, for those kids that are ready to make that jump and that come in in the door at 9, 10 or even 11, 12 going, yeah, this is what I want to do. This is where I want to be every day. Um, and we want to work towards that. And um, where we were when we first started and where we are now, it's been an iteration where we, you know, have gone through different phases and grown and kind of ironed out the wrinkles of it, but um, it's allowed us to grow. It's allowed us to get more kids in our, on our team. Um, and we're moving in the right directions. So, yeah, it's good. you have just to be clear with the, the sport and select, I think it's a pretty, um, pretty unique thing that a lot of people maybe have never even considered oh. allowing people the opportunity to play other sports or be involved in other organizations or other hobbies that they have or things that they want to compete in. Um, and just letting swimming be for their, for fun and for athletic developments, so they can still be a part of it, still get faster, but it's not like, Hey, this is, this is my main thing. Having a team like that, I think is pretty unique. And then to be clear, like 
you guys have some pretty quick people on the sport team too, right? And they just make the decision like, hey, yeah. I just don't want to swim, you know, every single day. Yeah, we do. Um, we have all levels. And um, there's some kids that, um, you know, you'd like to see that are would make the jump to select, but that's just not what they want to be doing. That's just not what their time or commitment level has in them for them. And, you know, that's okay. Um, I look, I think back to way back when in my time with Martins, there were kids that chose not to go into the national level group because they felt more comfortable or felt like the commitment and just the senior level was what they needed. And like those kids were still going to junior nats and stuff. And yeah, so I think you can have fast kids on the sport team that are still getting what they need and still getting faster and still contributing to the team. And, um, we don't differentiate between like you can't go to this meet if you're on this team or that team there's some scheduling stuff we do just because our lc is not built to really handle 450 person teams with how sure. they schedule out meets and everything yeah um, so we've had, we've had to get creative and we're working through different ways and new ways and then i'm also trying some new stuff with swim meets because i like to try new stuff um yeah. <laughs> so we're, we're working through some of that with, with, um, the sport team and the select team, but you know, like you can get on the select team and you start in our black group, white group, purple group, get into our high school group and potentially be going to junior nats. And like, that's the goal is, um, but it's all on your commitment level. And, but that's the way it is on our, on any team. Like, yeah, any kid's going to only reach their level based off of how committed they are and what they want to get out of it. But I love that for multiple reasons. One, because you're allowing kids to have autonomy in the process and you're not taking away the opportunity for them to do what they want to do at their yeah. stage of life, which is huge because that means they're going to enjoy the sport and the people who enjoy the sport are also long term going to be the most successful. So it's going to be interesting to see this. And this is still kind of in its infancy, you know, a couple of years in and seeing this uh, over time and building that it's going to uh, have a massive impact. I have no doubt. Um, but yeah, on top of that, they're not um, – if they don't want to be there every single day for every single practice and they're in the same lane as someone who does, <laughs> then yeah. then it pulls away from everybody in that top group too, right? Because, like, yeah. I don't really want to be here doing what they're doing, but I'm in here, and so we're just shoving people into lanes who some of them want to be there and some of them don't. So having that sport and select puts the people who really are all in on swimming as their sport – people who are like, Hey, I enjoy it, but not at that level yet. I don't want to commit to that level. They both have something they enjoy. And then the people who are focused on it as their main sport, they get to really soar because everybody wants the same thing in that group. And I think a lot of teams struggle with trying to cater to everybody because you have so many different types of things in one practice. But when you just create other opportunities for people, in my opinion, that creates an awesome awesome team culture. Have you noticed that, that effect already? Is it something you're hoping for down the road? Um, I definitely think it's improved, um, in that area because I do think, um, and I think any coach here, um, or that's listening can probably relate to the time they had that kid that only wanted to come to practice once or twice a week and what that did to the other kids, especially if that kid's good and they were yeah. beating <laughs> the kids that were working six, seven days a week and like just, what that does to the group, the inner group culture, um, really catches up to you and can cause a lot of problems. Um, so finding those kids, the right spot where then that now they fit in and now they're able to contribute to the team in their way, in a positive way, um, just really helps define that, especially at the senior level. Um, I don't think you see that as much at the age group level, just because those kids are still doing a lot of stuff. And most of those kids just are excited to be at the pool and yeah. be near friends they're not noticing that oh timmy timmy's not here today so he's gonna come tomorrow and slack off and it's gonna annoy me they're <laughs> they're just not worried about that but at the senior level right. like that catches up to a senior group and can really tear apart a group quickly yeah yeah that makes sense well, i love that you're constantly innovating constantly thinking of new ways um to run the team to help set everybody from the parents to the coaches to the kids up for success um, and that's something that's been exciting for me to seeing and witnessing all these things and learning from you too, from, a, um, from the business side of things for how to best set things up behind the scenes so that everybody can thrive in all the things that they're trying to do and that they have a passion for. Um, and so absolutely love that mindset. Is that something that 
um, you have always had? Is that something that comes from your family? Is that something that um, you know you've just developed over time, and you realize innovation and learning is all—is it a part of the always be learning, or or is that just something um, that you've always enjoyed? Um, I'm just like my parents just raised me to just always do your best. Like that's just instilled in my head. If you're going to do something, do it right, do it well. Um, like that's something my dad consistently said to me. Um, and my love my dad. He's awesome. Um, and so just anything I'm doing, I'm always just like, well, if I'm going to do it, I'm going to get the most out of it and I'm going to make it the best I can. Um, and so that's kind of where that comes from. I think is just, I don't really have to much if I'm going to, I'm going to put the energy into doing it. I'm going to do it as, as well as I can mm -hmm. uh, and get the most out of it for everyone. Yeah, no, that makes sense. It's awesome. It's a great mindset. And do you have a vision or a goal like in the next handful of years that you're, you guys as, as a staff have talked about with wave or th something that you're really excited or passionate about on the horizon? Um, yeah. So, I mean, we sit down, we sat down about a year and a half ago, well, maybe like a year ago, um, and set up some goals as like internal goals as a coaching staff of where we want to go, what we want to do, um, and set some, some metrics on kind of reaching some stuff, which we've definitely done over the last year. And we're, we'll sit down this summer again, um, and kind of map through. I'm not huge on goals. I like it personally. That's just not how, what motivates me or drives me. Like I'm more about like the grind. Like that's where I'm my best at is just mm -hmm. showing up daily, working hard daily. And like, mm -hmm. you know, no, I'm trying to go over there, but it's not about looking up over there all the time. It's about taking the small steps towards there each day. Um, but a lot of my coaches are more goal oriented and we talked about it in a coaches meeting last week and like, they want to set it up. And so, um, we'll meet next well we got like a meeting in the next couple of weeks and so we'll start talking about some of that stuff start looking at some of it and um we're trying to get our goals um lined up with the olympic quad and so with this year kind of coming up this trials this year we'll try and set goals for the next four years from here yeah you guys have a large staff and yet you guys do a fantastic job of keeping everybody i think that's a big struggle of a lot of teams is turnover and i think a massive part of that is um the leadership setup which starts with you but involves everybody in the organization obviously um and so you guys have done a great job with that but do you have any advice for um coaches with bigger staffs like how do you um keep everybody connected um how, how do you guys have such camaraderie i guess is what i'm asking with your staff because you have multiple locations and you have a lot of staff members doing a lot of different things um, how do you maintain camaraderie with a, with a coaching staff like that? Oh, this one goes against like my internet. It's meetings, communication and meetings. Um, <laughs> you know, when I was head age group coach, I used to hate sitting through some of the meetings. Um, because I just felt like you'd sit through an hour meeting for five minutes of information. Um, but they're huge for what we're trying to do as an organization of keeping all of our group leads, um, on the same page. Um, but it's also important. Um, because I don't want to just be the only one driving the boat. I want all the buy-in from them. And that means they need to be a part of the decisions that are made. Hmm. And so, um, we use a lot of the meetings to go, okay, here's the problem. Like Tuesday we were doing, um, our long course meet schedule. And so I shared it out and was like, Hey, this is what I'm thinking. What, what's everybody else thinking? What should we add? What should we take out? Like, where are you guys at? And then just kind of walk through and, you know, some coaches participate more than others, depending on what the topic is. Um, but just giving everybody a voice is huge for what I try and do. Um, and that's been learned. Like when I, my first year as head coach, it was a lot more like, all right, this is what we're doing. This is what we're doing. And like um, taking a few years off coaching to just be the head coach and executive director really forced me into stepping back and being like, all right, I need to ask these, ask everyone what their input is because I'm not on the deck. I don't know. Um, and so I need to, and so now that I've come back to the pool deck, it's like, it's, it's good because we've established, like, this is the process of getting everyone involved and asking for that feedback. And then now I have a better lens into like what the day to day is looking like, um, with things. That's awesome. Um, so communication is a big thing. You can't ever over communicate when you're trying to run a big organization. Yeah. 
that's that's good and people oftentimes like that's just things they don't want to do it's not fun to like schedule meetings yeah. and to communicate that much and um but a lot of the things you're saying is like you just have to do these things you have to be disciplined and consistent with meetings with um with how you run things with actually just uh, making things happen as opposed to talking about them is the constant theme that i've uh, heard today, but seen over the last handful of years, it's just, you're constantly doing things. Um, they're not talking about things and, um, that's, that's how you create a culture. You actually do yeah. and implement. So, um, do you have, if you don't mind, if people wanted to reach out to you, cause honestly, I think like in terms of like r setting up an organization and running it to allow your people to enjoy being a part of an organization, um, there's very few people who come close to what you're doing. And I'm sure there'd be some coaches out there who would love to pick your brain a little bit um, or parents even. Um, do you have um, like a email that you'd be willing to share for people to reach out if they have any questions? Well, first off, thank you. That's super humbling. Um, sure, man. I still feel like I'm learning a lot. So like, like when you texted me about being on the podcast, I was like, why do you want me? You're <laughs> awesome. Uh, <laughs> But yeah, I mean, it's just Chad Winkle, no anything in there at waveaquatics.org. Um, yeah, just shoot me an email. I'm happy to help. I like sharing what I know. I feel like if everyone rises, you rise too. And so I spend a lot of time chatting with other coaches in our LSC and other coaches I know about different problems they're having, what problems I'm having, getting feedback in that area. Um, I still bug the old head coach here, Tyson, every once in a while with issues. That <laughs> um, it's awesome. Yeah. yeah. People, a lot of times, I think as coach, even myself, like even running swim strong, like one of my least favorite parts of, of running it is the business side of things, but it's one of the most important parts because if you don't have a smooth running business, you can't impact all the people that you're trying to impact in the way that you want to. And so, um, so I think there's, lot that i have to learn and still learn from you there's a lot that coaches across the country we want to coach but you can't forget about you know running the team so that you can coach and serve people at the highest level so uh, that's super insightful stuff so valuable i hope people do reach out um and uh take a listen to this podcast even just that i'm sure people will be impacted by it chad i want to thank you for taking the time yeah, to be on much. here and for everything that you do uh for the wave family for the swim strong family it's a privilege to be a part of it man so thank you yeah, thank you for having me. Shout out to Brittany. Um, <laughs> you know, I shouted out Sean when she came to visit. So now I'm shouting out Brittany during the podcast. <laughs> there you go, Brittany. Brian, you got your shot. <laughs> we love you, man. We appreciate it. We'll see you. Thank you for listening to the Swim Strong Dry Land podcast. If you'd like to be a part of the Swim Strong Dry Land family, you can reach out to us via email or social media. You can also follow Swim Strong Dry Land on YouTube and TikTok for more educational content.